everyone. I'm Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to The Grim Curriculum. So last week we covered the incredibly frustrating and heartbreaking story of the disappearance of Walter Collins, the treatment of his poor mother Christine, as well as the mess of an investigation that led to Walter Collins never being successfully located. And once again, just a quick thank you to everyone for your response to that specific episode. We really, really appreciate yeah. the love. It's always nice to hear. Yeah. We also mentioned that last week's episode was a bit of a precursor to what we're going to be talking about today. That's right. So today we're going to be talking about the crimes of Gordon Stewart Northcott, a 19-year-old Canadian who settled in what was then known as Wineville, California. What makes Gordon Northcott somewhat unique when it comes to other people we've talked about before is that he didn't act alone. His partner in crime was Dear Mummy. And apparently the apple did not fall too far from the tree because these two are some of the absolutely most rotten humans that we've covered. Absolutely. And while Walter Collins was proven to likely not be a victim of the North Gots, his case led to what is now known as the Winebale Chicken Coop Murders to make national news that same year. Gordon Stewart Northcott has been compared by many to other sadistic killers such as John Wayne Gacy and Dean Coral. And while the confirmed victim count of Northcott seems small compared to those two, it can be pointed out that he committed his crimes when he was much, much younger. He has three confirmed victims, although the number is likely as high as nine. And that number is based on his confessions. However, he was charged with only three of the murders. We do want to point out that while the potential of nine victims may seem high, there were many members of the investigation who believed that the number could have been as high as 20. This number is based off of how many possible murder victims he could have. We do know for a fact that he was sexually assaulting numerous underage boys and letting them go afterwards during this time as well. It was also rumored that he would sometimes get visits from wealthy men from Southern California who would also victimize the boys. But as it stands, we can't fully confirm that, although we will talk about it a bit more later as it comes up. I think we can all probably agree that that wouldn't be a huge surprise no, if it not was true. At all. Especially once you know the story, like... For yeah. sure. Yeah. So his overall MO was to abduct boys from in and around the area and bring them to the ranch to abuse them. Some were let go while others were either shot or killed with an axe and then disposed of. His crimes are really heinous. He was executed at the age of 23 and one could really wonder how high his victim count would have been if he wasn't caught. Which again, his age is one of the things that really stands out about him. The guy was executed at the age of 23 and the amount of pain and havoc that he unleashed onto the world in his relatively short life says a lot about the kind of person that he was. This guy is pretty terrible, you guys. We saw a little bit about the kind of person he was last week when we talked about the mind games that he played with Christine Collins. He promised her answers in regards to her missing son, and then at the very last minute, he refused to even speak to her. Incredibly cruel, especially considering everything that she had gone through at that point. This guy is a real piece of work, and we're really going to see that today. Not to mention his mother. Oh yeah, we're definitely going to be talking about her some more. Like always, with these monsters, we are going to start at the beginning. And what a beginning it is, because this guy's story is pretty rough from the start. Gordon Stewart Northcott was born on November 9th, 1906 in Bladworth, Saskatchewan, which in 2021 had a whopping population of 71 people. And that 71 is actually quite the booming increase for them. So even now, 116 years later, it's considered a small village. His mother, Sarah Louise Northcott, has been rumored to have not been his biological mother. In fact, she testified in court regarding his true origins. There, she stated that while his father was his biological father, his biological mother was actually his older sister, Winifred. Yikes. We, we love a little uh, family fun. Oh, it's, oh it makes my skin crawl. I hate it. This is another one of those cases where his life is awfully rough right off the bat. This case, like, it's gross. Like, that's really the way that yeah. I could describe Sorry, this. Is it's gonna make your skin crawl, so just prepare yourselves emotionally, because it's gonna continue to get worse from that. As, as they often do. They sure do. We tend to do that. Gordon Northcott would later say that his childhood was absolutely horrific. His father, Cyrus Northcott, began sexually assaulting him at the age of 10. This is a cycle of abuse that would continue on with Gordon Northcott's victims. He also reported that his mother would dress him in women's clothing when he was a small child. I feel like there's another serial killer that either we've talked about or maybe is just well known whose parents or mom also dressed him in. You know, we haven't done any episodes on any serial killer specifically like that, but that does tend to be a little bit of a common thread. 
Um, there's quite a few serial killers out there where they were born to a mother who wanted a girl and didn't yes, get one. And, yes, totally. And, you know, um, that's definitely kind of a type, I guess, that we could kind of look at talking about in the future because they're they're out there. I, I mean, was gonna. It's, it's enough that it rang a bell with absolutely. me. Absolutely, and this. and I'm sure a lot of people even hearing this are gonna like think of someone Probably. when they hear that because it's. Oh, man. That's not, not a good start for old uh, Gordon. No, definitely not. Eventually, the family relocated from Saskatchewan to British Columbia, but they would finally settle in 1924 in what was then Wineville, which was located in Riverside County in California. I feel like going from small town Saskatchewan to California would be such a huge shock, like even back then. I mean, just weather-wise. Oh my god, yeah. Can you imagine going from a Saskatchewan winter to a California winter? You'd think you died and gone to heaven. Oh my god, (laughs) it's so accurate. Oh, man. So, Wineville was a small town that was located in the desert. While it was not as developed as some of the larger areas at the time, it was still populated by new farms, houses, and businesses were beginning to pop up. Two years later, at the age of 19, his father would buy him land in Wineville, as well as help him construct an area to raise chickens and build a house. Unfortunately, this would be eventually where he killed his victims and would keep their bodies. His father would later take his own life while institutionalized in an asylum. And that's not all. His uncle also died while serving a life sentence for murder. So, quite the pedigree on this guy. Quite the history. We're not going to talk about his mom too much until later in the episode, because honestly, we don't know a ton about her until the shit kind of hits the fan, and then we really find out what a terrible human being she is. If we haven't made it clear, she is as much of a monster as her son was. Most of what we know about her is from after her arrest. This is one of those cases where because he was executed so shortly after he was caught, we don't really have a whole lot to go off of. Sarah Northcott lived a lot longer than he did, and so a lot of what we do know is directly from her. But it made me wonder while we were working on this episode, did she enable him in a way that she committed the crimes with him because she couldn't say no, or was it because she was as sick and sadistic as he was? Because I have a lot of questions about her that are unanswered. It's... That's the problem with the cases that happened so long ago. There's not anything really to look back on. And yep. the like psychology and medical and technology just wasn't where it is obviously today. And so there's not the record of the things that we would find important to know today kind of thing. And that was one thing that made researching this case so hard is a it was a long time ago records as we've learned by now are going to be not great from back then Mm -hmm. but also these crimes really happened over a short period of time so like they kind of talked about it and then stopped talking about it because they wanted to forget about it yeah and then you know newspapers just as they are today are chasing new headlines you know once it's old news it's old news and especially once the the killer is executed they're like well he's dead story's over and honestly once the next bad thing happens because bad things were happening so yeah very true Mm -hmm. so the land that he purchased was kind of a mess at this point there were shrubs and weeds pretty much everywhere there was a lot of work to be done soon after he moved in he brought his 13 year old nephew Sanford Clark over from Bladworth under the pretense that he needed help getting the farm up and running this would not bode well for Sanford who almost immediately became the subject of physical and sexual abuse from Gordon seriously like he brought him out and the abuse started immediately Luckily, Sanford's 19-year-old sister, Jessie, began to worry about him and came out to the farm to see if he was okay. He was still writing to her on a pretty regular basis, but she began to notice that his overall tone and attitude in the letters had changed. She was also aware that he stopped going to school, and at this point, enough time had passed by where she was really worried about whether or not he was alright. So after she showed up, pretty quickly realized that Sanford was far from okay. In fact, he told her that he truly feared for his life. Jesse was clearly very worried about his well-being, but she had no clue that there was so much more he wasn't telling her. Apparently, she wasn't the only one who noticed something was wrong, and this story is kind of a weird one. In the summer of 1928, so not too long before he was caught, Gordon Northcott visited the district attorney's office to complain about one of his neighbors. He said that the neighbor behaved in a way that was profane and violent, and that it offended his nephew, who was training to be a priest. So the same nephew that he was abusing. Pretty ironic. Now, the neighbor was spoken to, and he was basically like, Listen, I've seen him beating up his nephew. There's something going on at the ranch. You might want to look into this. One of the things to point out with Gordon Northcott's crimes is that we really only found out about them after Sanford was spoken to about his abuse. If he hadn't, who knows how long the crimes would have gone on for or how many more young boys Gordon Northcott would have killed. 
Gordon Northcott showed absolutely no signs of stopping anytime soon. I think we can all agree that he wouldn't have just randomly stopped killing if he hadn't been caught. Who knows how high his victim count could have been. So this is where you can see that the John Wayne Gacy comparison makes a lot of sense. The crimes also allegedly only occurred throughout 1926 to 1928 when Gordon lived on the farm. So this was only a two year period. We also really want to stress that Sanford Clark was again only 13 when he was brought to the farm. We're going to be talking about his personal involvement with the murders, but we want to make it very clear that he is the victim here and that he is someone that Gordon Northcott preyed on and he forced him to do either terrible things or be killed himself. Late one night, shortly after Jessie arrived on the farm, Sanford sat her down and told her that he had more to tell her about Gordon, who was fast asleep in the next room. He told her that he had been physically and sexually abusing him. And if that wasn't horrifying enough, he also told her that Gordon Northcott had been responsible for the murders of at least four boys that he knew of. It is during that conversation that Sanford allegedly asked his sister if she had heard anything about the Walter Collins kidnapping. By this point, almost everyone had heard about Walter Collins, so she told him that she had. What he told her next would shock her and start a snowball effect of horrifying discoveries on the farm. He told her that Gordon Northcott had kept Walter at the ranch for a little over a week and had killed the boy when people started searching for him. He also told her about the other young men who met their ends at the hands of Gordon Northcott. These crimes occurred over the span of only two years, and unfortunately, there isn't a lot that's known about the victim. Seriously, like when I was looking into this case, I was honestly really, really saddened to see how little information is actually available about these poor kids. The death of a child is obviously incredibly tragic, but I feel like when we don't know much about them, or even their names in some cases, it just adds to the devastation of the whole thing to me. It's like the idea of these kids being victimized and then completely lost to time that just gets me with this case. And a lot of the cases like that, it's what made researching Luis Garavito so difficult for me. Absolutely. And you think of potentially all the other kids, like Walter Collins' mom looked for him until the day she died. Yep. How many others also looked for their boys but never heard anything ever again, right? It's really tragic because they just get forgotten about and that's it. Awful. After Jessie spoke to Sanford, she very quickly fled back to Canada to report what she had learned to the authorities. She found an American consul near her and reported Gordon Northcott's crimes to them. We've seen in previous episodes how complicated it can get when crimes span across different counties or even states. But now we're looking at tracking a crime in the U.S., from Canada in 1928. And this probably would have been quite complicated. It isn't like today where we have the databases that are internationally available. And honestly, even with all of the advancements in communication since then, we still see how difficult this can be. So in 1928, this was an incredibly complicated procedure. It's one that involved a lot of paperwork and we're gonna see just how difficult that makes everything too. So the consul, upon finding about his crimes, wrote a letter to the LA Police Department which detailed the crimes and complaints made by Jesse. They also included the fact that Jesse had informed them that Sanford was in the country illegally. Once they got the letter, they did not immediately investigate the crimes. Like we said, because this was also an immigration concern, it was a lot more complicated than just running over and arresting him. They first contacted the U.S. Immigration Service and confirmed that everything that they were told about who he was was true, and on August 31st, 1928, two immigration inspectors named Judson F. Shaw and George W. Scalhorn showed up to the farm. I have never, in my 31 years on this planet, heard the name I, Judson. I love hearing some of these, like, old-timey oh, names that I you like just Judson. don't hear anymore. Judson is cool, and I in very much enjoy how they put the middle initial i like that too yeah i like that i, I don't, don't know what it is but it kind of gives it like more authority somehow. i think it does yeah. yeah absolutely so i got curious as i do and i learned that there's a judson alberta okay and it had some really amazing dinosaur discoveries that happened there oh, not too long ago they have like I a historic this. site they have like a little museum and a random fun alberta fact for all of you i love that yeah judson alberta friends good to know. i've never heard of it so Me fun fact for the day that judson. can take up some more space in my brain <laughs> So, Gordon, being the brave little man he was, saw the two agents driving up the road to his farm and immediately took off and ran for the tree line, all the while yelling at Sanford to keep them distracted. He threatened to shoot and kill Sanford if he didn't comply, and I want to say, Pee Wee Gaskins did this. 
Yes, he sure did. Pee Wee Gaskins did literally exactly yes. this. And it's the idea of a grown man. Like, Pee Wee Gaskins, I'll say he ran straight up into a tree like the little squirrel that he is. <laughs> but, like, the idea of this, like, horrible, evil man just, like, running off into the forest like a chicken shit is just... I... Ugh. Eef, nasty. So... Two whole hours, for two whole hours, Sanford Clark would stall and deal with the police himself while Gordon Northcott ran away like a little chicken shit. And I mean, that says so much about Gordon. Like, he's a terrible person, we know that, but he's also a giant coward who, instead of dealing with the consequences of his actions, left a 13-year-old boy to stall for him. And at the risk of being killed, too. So Sanford, at this point, he knows very well what Gordon's capable of. Oh, yeah. He knows that he's capable of murder. He basically just left him there to say he had no clue where his uncle was or when he'd be back. As his uncle is, oh, running Sanford, through the Sanford, stall! I would have been like, you, what, do you, what do you want me to tell these people? Poor kid. Oh my. So, once Sanford, smart boy that he was, realized that enough time had gone by that he was no longer at risk of being shot by his uncle, he told them that Gordon Northcott had fled. And he wasn't alone. Gordon Northcott fled with his dear old mommy, Sarah Louise. So there's some different versions about how, like, all of this went down. Some versions say that Sarah Louise and Gordon were driving when they saw the agents approach them, and then they fled by car. But as it stands, it's most likely that the first version that he told is the correct one. Yeah, the mom was at the house pretty often, and it's it's that seems to be what most yeah. likely happened, is that he just ran into the forest like a chicken. The police, they began to interview Sanford Clark, and what he told them would shock them. He spoke about Gordon sexually abusing him, as well as many other boys. He also said that his uncle had killed numerous boys, and that he not only witnessed it happen, but was also forced to help. He also said that Sarah Louise Northcott had been involved. The mother and son duo fled to British Columbia and were arrested near the town of Vernon on September 19th, 1928. And it's actually rumored, but not fully confirmed, that Sarah Louise may have actually been found somewhere in our very own province of Alberta, although we couldn't completely confirm it again. The details with this case, the amount of stuff that's actually left over in regards to info is, is kind of short, but we're pretty sure that uh, she, she could have been there. Cool. While they were waiting to be extradited, Gordon gave an interview to the Vancouver Daily Sun where he said that he was completely innocent and that they had fled because his mother had been shocked by the accusations against them. It's a typical response yeah. to... But I, like, do you think he was, they, what I'm trying to say is, do you think the newspaper came to him or do you think he went to the newspaper and was like, I have a complaint about the United States? Oh my god, uh, he seems like the kind of guy who like... I mean, he literally tattled on himself yeah. to the attorney general, so it kind of makes sense to me that he's like, oh, I got a story for the Vancouver But I son. didn't do it, I yeah, swear. It wasn't me. So the press, of course, went wild over this case. Tons of people from all around the country came to Wineville to report on the crimes. They gave Gordon Northcott the nickname Ape Man because he apparently had really hairy arms and a very hairy back. Out of everything, it's so funny to me what details people so pick bizarre. upon. Like, like, you have the Night Stalker, you have, like, all of these, like, crazy yeah. names for serial killers. Like, I mean, the only, I think, Goofy, Luis Garavito I got, like, so. a really shitty yeah. nickname, but this is probably but not a great Ape name. Man sounds to me more like a Batman villain. You know? <laughs> like... Yeah, don't, like, eight man, he's swinging through Gotham. Like, it, it doesn't, it, and it's like a shitty supervillain at that. Right, like, yeah, no, Gordon Northcott yeah. doesn't get to be a good supervillain. No. Fuck that. Uh, the press would report on the events of the trial on a daily basis, calling the scenes of the crimes a murder farm. So why not call him, like, the murder farm killer? The killer farmer! Yeah. The, like, I feel like so often there are missed opportunities when it comes to, like, giving good names to serial the killers. The chicken man slayer. I don't know, it doesn't roll off the tongue. No, it doesn't. <laughs> See, that's why I couldn't do this. I'd call him, like, the bad man. Sanford Clark and Jesse would both testify against Gordon and Sarah Louise. Sanford testified that Gordon had killed a total of four boys and that Sarah Louise had helped. He also spoke about being forced to help them with the crimes, and he was able to provide crucial information that aided the investigators in finding the bodies, or at least what was left of them. And that's something that made it incredibly difficult to figure out who the victims were, or even how many of them there were. 
They were dismembered into very small pieces and buried under limestone. Authorities did find three shallow graves where Sanford Clark claimed they would be. Jesse would later testify that Gordon Northcott and Sarah Louise Northcott had exhumed the bodies on August 4th and that the majority of the body parts were taken to a spot in the desert and burned. And the majority of those body parts were never discovered. What they did manage to find in the graves was what they chillingly referred to as 51 parts of human anatomy. Those silent bits of evidence of human bones and blood have spoken and corroborated the testimony of living witnesses. That's very poetic. It is. It kind of is, hey? Mm-hmm. So, if you didn't wrap your mind around that, essentially what they're saying is that they found the pieces of the bodies, but the determinations on who they were and how many of them there were were based off of the testimony of Jesse, Clark, Sir Louise, and of course, Gordon. One of the victims was never positively identified, but it's assumed by most that he was a young man named Alvin Gothia, who was only known as the Headless Mexican for a very, very long time, which, Ooh. holy crap, that is heartbreaking. Yeah. Like, that's the only thing that they knew about this child for the longest time. His nationality and that he was missing his head. Yeah, and that's it. And the fact that they Ugh. think it was Alvin Gothia, not confirmed, that's just who it most likely is. So. Ugh. And guys, this is going to get into some pretty dark stuff here real quick, so just a, a warning for that. According to Sanford Clark, he was forced to dispose of the boy's head by burning it in a fire pit and then crushing the skull into small pieces. Gordon Northcott admitted to leaving the headless body on the side of the road because at the time he had, and I quote, no place to put it. The headless body had actually been found a few months prior by police. A motorist had been driving when he saw bare feet sticking out from under some sacks on the side of the road. The body was completely nude and had a gunshot wound to the side of it. It was concluded that the head was removed before the body had been brought to the road. It's around this time that it was presumed that Walter Collins was found amongst those at the farm. We talked a lot about what happened with all of that in our last episode, so we won't go over it again fully. But basically, Sarah Louise claimed that they killed the boy, as did Gordon Northcott. Sarah Louise would later recant her confession while Gordon cruelly made Walter's mother, Christine, visit him a few days before his execution with promises that he would tell her the truth about what happened with her son. As we know now, he refused to speak to her the day she showed up and Christine Collins died years later not knowing the truth about what happened to her son. I really do wonder if Walter had actually been a victim of theirs because identifying a body at this time was nothing like it is now in regards to technology and stuff that we have available. But we also have to remember that there really wasn't much of a body left to identify. And I think it's incredibly possible, although on flip side, so of course, like, Walter fit the profile of Gordon, yep. unfortunately. However, as we've seen so far, Gordon's a bit of a fucking liar. Yeah. And he could have been like, this is the big story, I claim it. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. He wouldn't I mean, be the first serial killer no. to do that, and he certainly wouldn't be the last if that was the case. It's incredibly frustrating because we don't have the proper evidence to know if it was him. But also, like we said, Gordon and Sarah are giant liars. We're going to see that more right away. And we can't stress enough, these people have absolutely no redeeming qualities. None. So two victims that were properly identified were 12-year-old Lewis Winslow and his 10-year-old brother Nelson. These are two victims that we know the most about. And unfortunately, it really isn't much. The boys were on their way home from a yacht club meeting and were kidnapped in Panoma on May 16th, 1928. It is suspected that Gordon Northcott used Sanford Clark to lure the boys to the ranch. Sanford was around their age at the time, and it's likely that the boys had no reason not to trust him. Sanford would tell authorities and testify in court that he was forced to do this by his uncle. Now, we don't know exactly what happened to the boys, but it's believed, according to Gordon Northcott's confession, that he first killed the older brother with an axe. He claims that he killed the younger brother because he felt sorry for him. At one point, he said to authorities, I felt sorry for Nelson after I killed Louis. The little one was so distressed and wept so. There are so many serial killers that do this, like where they take two or more people and kill one, and then they say that they kill the other one to spare them from the horror of surviving it all. It just shows how absolutely evil and disconnected from reality some of these monsters are. Like, that line of thinking says so much about the kind of person that he was. Like, I do not care. There is zero justification for these killings. These monsters murdered innocent children. I would, I would never make a good detective, because if I was interviewing them and he fed me a line like this, 
I would fly over that interview table so goddamn fast. Like, fists would be flying. I can't imagine hearing that and, like, like not little, punching him in the face. Yeah, you little bitch. How dare you? Exactly. Like, ugh. He also wrote a letter to the parents of the children where he claimed that the kids had run away from home and that they would not return, but that they were fine. He wrote this note on a piece of paper that he had ripped out of a book. Upon investigation, that book was found on his farm, and this confirmed to investigators that Lewis and Nelson were indeed victims of Gordon Northcott. During the trial, Gordon's parents attempted to save their son's life and defend him. Sarah Louise claimed that he was a product of an incestuous relationship between her husband and their daughter, although as we said earlier on, that was never proven. And while that's heinous, if it's true, it's still not a fucking excuse no. to kill children. Absolutely Or anyone not. for that no. matter, but especially children. The public saw everything that was being reported on the crimes, and most people thought the entire thing was over-sensationalized even then. It got even worse when it was time for Gordon Northcott to have his day in court. So old Gordo chose to represent himself. He fired several lawyers and refused to do it any other way. Which we haven't seen this in anyone we've covered yet, but this is never a good move. You all know I hate to even mention him, but we saw this with Ted Bundy. Right? Like, when I was reading this, I was like, hmm, Mr. Bundy much? Exactly. Mind you, Bundy at least had some actual knowledge when it came to the law, and it still went very badly for him. But Gordon had absolutely no reason to even think about representing himself. This just, it says a lot about him. This went, as you can probably imagine, very poorly. He put himself on the stand and began asking himself questions and then answering them on his his own behalf. Can you imagine seeing that? Like, like witnessing what kind of this? Mickey like, Mouse who bullshit? The fuck like, are you? what the hell? He also kept saying throughout the entire trial, and this makes me like throw up in my mouth, a little, that he loved every single boy he killed. Sir, that makes it worse. So much worse. First of all, Sorry, guys, I'm, like, fired up. I'm in a spicy mood I hate this guy. Today, I hate but, this like, guy. I like, do this guy fucking, fucking hate sucks. This dude. Like, damn. First of all, no the fuck you didn't. How dare you? And if you did, this is not a statement that's gonna act in your favor, you rancid little man. Ugh, so, I hate him. Like, at this point, he also claimed that he was in a sexual relationship with his mom, Buh. who was trying to save his life. Yeah, and she's probably, like... For no, the I'm not. Of God, Nor- Gordon. Like, he also claimed that his father had been sexually abusing him from a young age. The press, loving every sensationalized minute of the trial, loved all of this, and at this point was reporting on the trial on an almost hourly basis. Gordon's father begged the court to consider being lenient towards his son, claiming that he was insane. And can you imagine? You're in court. You're hearing his mother testify about how the father had an incestuous relationship. Gordon is saying that the father abused him, and the father is like, please don't kill my son. If I was any part of this or any relative i'd be like i disown you i do not claim you people i am leaving that, right that's when you like because never speak to me again 1928 this is when you like go to the other side of the country change your name and tell people that you came from somewhere completely different or exactly. you had amnesia and you're like a brand new person totally because the, that was an option back then for people like this exactly oh. During the trial, Gordon would continue to torture the parents of his victims. He claimed to have killed Walter Collins, and then he would take it back over and over again. He also went from confessing the murders of the Winslow boys and then saying he had never met them before in his life. His story was confusing, it changed a lot, and overall made no sense. Luckily for the court, Sanford Clark was an excellent witness. His story never changed. And while his uncle would continue to lead investigators on in regards to the location of the bodies, Sanford took them directly to where they were and appeared to be honest and forthcoming with his information. At this point, there was no doubt that the death penalty was being looked at. Like his father, Sarah Louise didn't want to see her son executed for these crimes. She claimed at this time that one day she visited her son on the ranch and she saw Walter Collins asleep on a cot. She claimed that Gordon told her about how he had abused the boy and Sarah herself decided that the boy needed to die so that he didn't go to the police. She claimed that she, along with Sanford and Gordon, beat the boy to death with the head of an axe. She also said during this time that she was the one that dealt the final blow. Sarah Louise Northcott would be given a life sentence for her involvement in the crime. Gordon Northcott would be sentenced to death. 
he was to spend the rest of his days at the infamous San Quentin prison on their death row. His trial lasted 27 days. And the main reason Sarah Louise was not sentenced to die was because they just didn't want to execute a woman. Kind of tracks. I mean, to this day, it still tracks. Yeah. I mean, look at uh, Miss Carla Fay there. Exactly. It's got Carla Fay written all over it. Sure does. Gordon Northcott spent his short time in jail being an overall awful human being. He would constantly confess to more crimes for attention. He loved the spotlight and had no issues telling lies to constantly get it. When asked about how many victims he had, he replied, 18, 19, maybe 20. And he would constantly offer to go to the ranch with investigators to show them where the rest of the bodies were. Every time they were ready to take him out, he would change his mind at the last minute and refuse to cooperate. It's said that he actually did name the wealthy men who would visit his farm to abuse the boys, but the names were never made known to the public. Warren Duffy of San Quentin described his conversations with Gordon Northcott by calling them a lurid account of mass murder, sodomy, oral copulation, and torture so vivid that it made my flesh creep. And that statement really shows just how much joy he found in torturing people mentally. The father of the Winslow boys actually formed a mob and threatened to take Northcott from the courthouse himself to hang him. The mob was eventually calmed down by police with the promise that there would be justice. Can you imagine that? Like, all right, gentlemen, we know you want to kill him. Don't worry, we're going to kill him. Yeah, it, it will be served. You're just going to have to wait a little bit longer. So on October 2nd, 1930, Gordon Stewart Northcott would meet his end. He was taken to the gallows, and it is said that on the day of his execution that he was so nervous that he had to be blindfolded before they even began to walk him to the gallows. While he was walking, he became so weak that he had to be held up by two guards and forced to walk to where he was to be hanged. The closer he got, the more he began to scream and cry, begging for his life. Aww, I have so much not sympathy for no. this little bitch boy. No! This, this whole thing where he's, like, crying at the end makes me think that up to the day of his execution, he probably was so narcissistic and so evil and so into himself that he probably thought, no, I'll, I'll get away at the last minute. Like, something's gonna happen. Like, I can sit here and be a little shitbag to everybody around me, but... I'll get off in the end. He's so arrogant and evil. Like, he didn't possibly think that that could be the way he would go out. And that's kind of, like, from just, like, wanting to know from that standpoint. I wish, I almost wish that there was more in regards to interviews with him, more of his statements, more of his confessions that were available. Because mm -hmm. I want to know. Like, because I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think that he was incredibly narcissistic and he probably thought it was all just going to work out for him. Yeah, I, I genuinely think that he thought, like, oh, it's okay, someone will get me off my eventually. mom is gonna save me that's probably what he thought he probably thought probably. that sarah louise was gonna be yeah, able to save yeah them. she'll be here any minute now his last words as the rope was placed around his neck were reported to be don't don't the execution itself did not go well and the rope did not immediately break his neck instead it took him a whopping 15 minutes to die of strangulation and i will go on the record y'all can at me i can't say i pity him one little bit Karma's a bitch. It, it comes around sometimes. Sorry, Gordon. Sarah Louise Northcott would be paroled 10 years later in 1940, but she would die in 1944. As for Sanford, he was sent to the Whittier State School for five years by the Associate Prosecution Council, a man named Loyal C. Kelly. There it is again with that middle initial and the first name, Loyal? I trust him. I... Then, you know, they say there's something in a name. Right? Like, I picture a man with a very large hat and I trust him with my life. <laughs> Kelly recognized that Sanford was very much a victim of Gordon Northcott and specifically sent him to a place that focused on rehabilitation. Sanford Clark would later credit Loyal C. Kelly and his sister Jessie, as well as the Whittier State School, for saving his life. He would not be charged with any of the murders. And actually, the school didn't really make a big deal about who he was when he arrived. They sent him there very quietly, possibly to keep the press away, and they actually attempted to get him the help he needed. And I mean, we never no, see this no. in cases like this is a huge deal, especially back then. This would be a huge deal now. Well, considering like when Pee Wee goofed up the first time, he got sent to hell on earth. Exactly. You know, and it was a similar time time 
So, like, this is almost mind-boggling, to be honest. I mean, it really is, because you look at, uh, there's someone that I really, really want to cover in the future, Carl Panzram, yes. and he saw so much yes, terrible, he was another uh, one. so oh. much abuse at these state schools. So the fact that Sanford had a good experience, like, I hope all of you listening realize, like, that's like a unicorn that's of a school. Huge. That's yeah. unheard of. Absolutely. The school basically had him living with a group of boys in various cottages, and they were looked after by a den mother, a father, or sometimes both. The school focused on teaching skills like tailoring, cooking, woodworking, and other things that could help the boys find employment. And the school actually discouraged the boys from bragging about their past, and the superintendent made it very clear to them that that was no longer who they were. Sanford Clark would eventually serve in World War II and spent his life working for Canada Post. He married, and he and his wife adopted two sons, as Sanford did not want to continue his family line. Can't say I blamed him. Absolutely. Sanford described his mother as a sociopath who told him to go stay with his uncle. His uncle and grandmother were both killers, and his father was also not a good man. He was married for 55 years before his death in 1993, and all in all, he was incredibly loved by his family. What we see with Sanford Clark is something that even now we don't see too often, rehabilitation that actually works. Real rehabilitation. Yes. Like, that's what this is. That This is the goal. Yes. This is, to me anyways, and I think to me this is the goal is to... You know, you take a child that has been through so much and there's hope to make them a better person if yes. they have the resources. That's the thing. He was very lucky to find the resources and, and have someone to help him at yeah, the time. absolutely. But again, he, he could have finished school and gone on to be just like his shitty uncle. He could have he continued didn't. that cycle. And even the, even him just being like, not only am I not going to continue the cycle, but we're stopping this fucking family line here and now Yeah, that's, because it's bad. It's tainted. Absolutely, yeah. And it wasn't easy for him. No. Sanford Clark would attempt to take his own life numerous times, and he lived with a large amount of guilt and pain until the end of his days. And the thing that really broke my heart is researching this. Um, his son wrote a book, and uh, he talks about how on his deathbed, he told Sanford Clark that he loved him. And oh. Sanford Clark said to him, why would you love me if you know what I've done? Oh, and I'm just like, man. oh my God. Like, he did everything to move on and to be better and to and it just it stayed with him and how could it not well absolutely and (sighs) it's because he was a good person though exactly because you know what like i said he could have fully snapped and gone and continued that generational trauma and as much as his life was still incredibly hard and he was obviously traumatized yeah he still was a good person and, and that's the thing is like everything about him says that he was he was troubled and he had a lot of pain but he was a good man to the end yeah he yeah. really really was absolutely as for wineville they changed their name due to the bad press the town received it is now known as mira loma and has been since very shortly after the crimes happened other than a few street signs that display the name wineville the town has tried very hard to forget that part of its history And that's that, the Wineville Chicken Coop Murders. One of the few cases that we've covered where we saw some kind of justice. Because it seems to not happen as much with these old-timey cases. No, it really doesn't. I mean, we'll never truly know how many people Gordon killed, but at least he was stopped before he could kill more. And I absolutely believe that he would have killed more. I don't think he would have stopped until someone actually stopped him. I am honestly left wondering if Sarah actually did kill anyone or if she just said it in an attempt to spare her son because she recanted a lot of her confessions after he died and it, it just makes me wonder. I, I, I'm I going to go out on a limb and say he's definitely responsible for more than he was yeah. charged for. Based on his family's atrocious history, I can absolutely see Sarah Louise being involved directly, but also there's also the potential that she could have been scared of him as well. Yeah. And then that sort of weirdness mixed with a mother's need to protect her son, like, Mm -hmm. it can be really warped and twisted. I very much get Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like, family vibes from these guys. Oh my god, yeah. But I I think as a mother, like, she would do everything in her power to protect her son. Yep. So, like, who really knows? And we've established they're all liars. At the very least... I would argue that she is an accessory to his crimes. Absolutely. There's no way she wasn't aware of what he was doing. So at the end of the day, how could she stand by and do nothing? At the very least, while he abused his nephew Sanford. Like, that alone is disgusting. And then everything else on top And everything else on top, right? I completely agree. This case is messed up, you guys. I hope you enjoyed learning about it, because holy crap. 
Um, it's a rough one. It definitely is. And it is one that it has come so close, I think, to being forgotten. And yeah. I don't think it should because we see a lot in this case that we don't see in other cases. Again, we see justice. I think we do. Mm -hmm. um, and we see actual rehabilitation. Those are two things that if you look through the episodes that they we've done, go we, hand in they hand, do you guys. not. Like, we don't get to see that and we do get to see that here. And it's it's tragic and it's sad, but at least... At least the motherfucker died in the end. Yep. You know? And he died scared. Good. Fuck him. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> With all that being said, oh, no, I'm going to be spicy for the rest of the evening. But, uh, so next week, we're going to be covering a fun one where things are going to get really freaky. We're covering a case that we both yeah. absolutely love and we can't so wait excited. to share with you. Like, seriously, it's one of my favorites. Yes. I know Charlotte loves it. I do. We I both do. love it. It's going to be amazing and I cannot wait to bring it to you guys. So make sure you are listening next week because it's going to be thebomb.com. Heck yeah. Until then, make sure you don't miss out on the Grim Curriculum news by following us on Instagram at the Grim Curriculum and Grim Curriculum on Twitter. You can also find us on social media. I'm Dina V on Twitch. Dina V ig on instagram and dina v tweets on twitter and i'm ominous underscore walrus on twitter and ominous walrus on instagram join us every saturday for a brand new episode and we also do a live premiere on youtube at 12 p.m mst so come hang out with us and discuss the case in real time and leave those comments give us them yeah. likes and do the thing we do see them all you guys we appreciate them too so go ahead and subscribe to us on youtube go do that also yeah thanks for listening this has been the, the grim, grim curriculum, curriculum.